So again, <clears throat> great honor and, and privilege to be here today. And uh, I want to again extend a thank you for the invitation to speak here. I know that Dick Meltzer would have been uh, very interested to uh, have a chance to ask me questions about this, this topic. And I mentioned earlier that I, I wanted to say a few words during my talk about Dick. Um, I think you've already heard Dick was an outstanding person. He had a, uh, a, a very strong sense of uh, ethics and commitment to honesty, uh, sometimes almost to a fault. He was such an honest person. Um, he was an outstanding scientist and researcher, a loving son, husband and father, lover of Israel and the Israel Heart Society, and you already heard um, during the time of his life, he gave a significant donation in memory of his parents. Uh, he was a builder. He was somebody who could create uh, new programs and new opportunities, and I think he was always looking for new ways to improve patient care and diagnosis and early detection. An innovator, somebody who was very dedicated to prevention. I think he would have been very pleased with uh, the session here this morning and dedicated to patients and patient care, and a great friend. So in my talk this morning, uh, in the brief time that we have, this is the summary of what I want to talk about. Um, my focus is on the healthy patient, in the asymptomatic patient, the patient who would be seen in uh, general medical practice or maybe preventive cardiology practice. Uh, somebody who doesn't yet already have a diagnosis of heart disease. And I think that we see that risk prediction is continuing to be regarded as a central component of primary prevention in cardiology. The new guidelines from the United States and the new guidelines from uh, Britain um, are again reinforcing the idea of risk prediction in healthy people. But we, we know, and it's widely regarded, that risk factors alone fail to discriminate. Many people uh, who are low risk and high risk, and this leaves many people as intermediate risk, and half or more of the intermediate risk patients, uh, uh, or half of the events, occur in people that are so-called intermediate risk. Uh, the third point that I want to show some data about is that based on the studies that we have so far, it looks to me as if coronary calcium is the best current test for improving risk discrimination in asymptomatic people, but the issue of cost effectiveness, uh, it needs to be considered. And finally, I want to just say really almost just one word about CTA which I, I think is generally regarded as not really having a role in, in the primary prevention setting, primarily because of higher cost and uh, radiation exposure. So um, I mentioned 2013, just in November of last year, the uh, ACCHA guideline came out. I was one of the members of the risk assessment panel, and um, we endorsed the idea, uh, again, as we have in many previous guidelines of doing risk assessment in the asymptomatic patient with uh, generally the traditional risk factors. Just uh, a month or so ago, the Joint British Societies came out with literally uh, almost exactly the same set of recommendations, totally independently uh, operating and uh, looking at the same data. And I was uh, honored by the um, Joint British Society is asked to write the editorial about this, and my view of it, which I published in Heart last month, is that remarkably, uh, the British and American guidelines, um, completely separate committees looking at the same data came to virtually uh, the same recommendations, still recommending um, the traditional risk factors as the basis. But as I mentioned, the problem with the traditional risk factors as we see today, and this is a slide actually based on the European uh, uh, measurement of traditional risk factors, the SCORE, uh, systematic coronary risk evaluation model from Europe. 
what they did on the x-axis here was that they took a population and estimated the 10-year risk of cardiovascular disease mortality using the score. And then they plotted the number of deaths within the population according to the score. So we know that there's an association between the score and risk. People at the high end of the risk prediction have the highest risk. But the problem is that a lot of the events are occurring down here at the lower end of the distribution. And this is where the challenge is in preventive cardiology is we're, we're estimating a large number of people as actually low risk, and yet a lot of the events are occurring in that group. So how do we identify these people and how could we target them for therapy? So a number of years ago, um, I got involved uh, as one of the investigators in the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis. This is an American study. It involves 6,800 6, people from six clinical centers in the United States. We all recruited about 1,100 uh, healthy people. Um, and the initial results on coronary calcium from this study were reported in the New England Journal in 2008. And by now, I'm, I'm sure that many of you are already familiar with this uh, study. Uh, the simple uh, summary of the findings were that if we looked in the total population, look at the area under the uh, ROC curve, and I'm glad Dr. Gans showed ROC curve, so everybody is familiar with that concept already. I don't need to show uh, what that is, but the area under the ROC curve for the uh, traditional risk factors in the healthy population here was 0.79. And when we added coronary calcium to the model, we got a rather large uh, increase. Here we go. We got a large increase in the ROC curve from 0.79 to 0.83. And that was uh, true whether we looked at major coronary event or any coronary event. There was this large increase in the ROC curve. In a subsequent analysis that uh, we did, we focused on the intermediate risk specifically because we said, you know, if, if, if we can already identify who the high risk people are, we're going to treat them intensively. And if we can already identify the low risk, we can feel comfortable excluding them from intensive preventive intervention. But we know, as I showed earlier, that a lot of the events occur in the intermediate risk. So we took only the intermediate risk people in the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis, and we looked at which, predict, which particular predictors would be helpful in improving risk prediction in intermediate risk. And we compared the Framingham risk score in the, in the sort of blue color to Framingham risk score plus coronary calcium, Framingham risk score plus carotid IMT, Framingham risk score plus brachial flow mediated dilation, Premium risk score plus C-reactive protein or plus family history or plus ankle brachial index. What you can see here, whether we looked at incident coronary disease or incident total cardiovascular disease, the ROC curves for everything virtually were completely overlapping with the Framingham risk score except for this one right here and right here. And those are the coronary calcium. So what we're seeing is the coronary calcium in the overall population is helpful in discrimination and Framingham risk score plus coronary calcium, you get this big increase in the discrimination, even in the intermediate risk population. And these findings have been confirmed now in a number of other studies, including the Rotterdam study. Rotterdam study is a uh, population of um, mostly healthy and mostly asymptomatic uh, uh, individuals from the city of Rotterdam in the Netherlands. That's about uh, 6,000 people above the age of 55. And they also looked at a number of the so-called novel, uh, I'm not so sure how novel these are anymore. Proteomics is novel, but these findings are, these findings are getting to be, uh, you know, almost uh, mundane, but at least um, uh, interesting to look at which of these mundane novel risk factors are uh, useful in risk prediction. And as we showed in the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis, coronary calcium stands out above all the rest. And the next one in, in Rotterdam that was helpful is BNP, everything else, fibrinogen, CRP, carotid IMT, uh, 
ankle brachial index, pulse wave velocity, homocysteine, et cetera. No change at all in the, in the C statistic in the area under the ROC curve. So the next question that one would, I think, logically ask, how am I doing on time, T? Am I good? Okay. So the next question that would probably be logically asked is, um, uh, what's the cost effectiveness of doing a test like a coronary calcium, a radiation exposure with a uh, cost? Uh, it's not, you know, a $5 blood test. It costs uh, something more than, than that and certainly involves uh, radiation. So we looked at this uh, fairly uh, much in depth, and this was reported just a couple of months ago in Circulation, Cardiovascular Quality and Outcomes. And the first author in this guy named Mark Pletcher from San Francisco, I'm sure Dr. Gans knows him very well. And um, I think this is a very nice study that looked at uh, uh, the cost effectiveness of coronary calcium in different populations. So we looked in women and men in this analysis, and we looked at different levels of risk, 2.5%, 10-year risk, 5%, 7.5%, 10%, et cetera. And if your assumption is that statins are uh, low risk and inexpensive, um, the conclusion of the cost effectiveness analysis, which I can recommend that you read, it, it would take me an hour to explain it, but uh, let me just show this one slide as a uh, summary. Basically, if you have favorable statin assumptions, meaning that doesn't really bother people to take it, doesn't cost very much, Really, you don't need any additional tests. The conclusion of the cost effectiveness analysis, you just put the entire world on statin. On the other hand, if you have less favorable statin assumptions, um, meaning that the statins cost uh, more and that patients don't like to take the statins, then you do find that there are areas in which it would be very helpful to do additional testing, such as coronary calcium, and if calcium is present, then you would treat. Um, and literally just this week, um, I think I was sitting on the airplane coming here and looking at my email, and I saw this uh, paper that just uh, was published online in circulation a week ago. And what they did, this is a study from Britain in which they went out and asked people who were high risk and who should be candidates for statin therapy, how would they feel about going on a statin for the rest of their life? And I think that this study is very interesting because it reflects clinical experience. I think very often in the clinical setting, we're very confident that a statin would be uh, an important recommendation for the patient. And when we explain it to the patient, they say, I don't want to do that. And that's exactly what this uh, study uh, shows. And the conclusion of this study was we can no longer assume that medication disutility is almost zero. Over a quarter of the people uh, reported disutility exceeding the group average longevity gain from statins. So in other words, in other words, I think what we have is what Dick Meltzer would have wanted us to conclude. We have some tests that are useful. We use the tests in the clinical setting and we make average assessments of what the risk is. And then we take that information and we go to the patient and we present it to the patient and we say, our recommendation is, based on the tests that we've done, you should or should not go on a statin. And then the patient says, yes or no. And that's what this study seems to show. And I think Dick would have been very happy with that result. Um, I was asked to say a word or two about um, coronary CTA in the asymptomatic setting. And the only thing I want to say about it is that this um, in the appropriate use criteria for uh, uh, cardiac CT uh, in this reference by uh, Alan Taylor and Jill Steiner, basically what they're saying here is that um, for coronary CTA, they're, they're saying inappropriate for evaluation in person with lower intermediate risk and uncertain in the evaluation in high global risk. And what that essentially comes down to is it's a higher radiation exposure than simple coronary calcium measurement. It's a higher cost, and it doesn't add much more for the risk assessment than just the coronary calcium information, so generally not recommended. So my last slide summary, risk prediction continues to be a central component of the current prevention guidelines in the U.S. and Britain and Europe. 
Risk factors alone fail to discriminate many people at low and high risk, leaving many in the intermediate risk. Chlorinated calcium, I think, turns out to be the best current test for improving risk discrimination, and its use appears to be most appropriate in the intermediate risk people. Cost effectiveness does not seem to favor the use of coronary calcium in most people, um, but for those uh, expressing uh, you know, regard, concern about going on a statin for the rest of their life, coronary calcium might actually be a useful test to help convince them. And uh, as I said earlier, I think Dick would have said, yeah, you got to talk to the patient, Phil. You can't just do the test. And finally, CTA is not indicated in asymptomatic people due to the higher cost and higher radiation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Greenland. <laughs> we are a little bit behind schedule, so Dr. Verde. Maybe one question. One question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for an excellent talk. Do we have already any data regarding the uh, added value of the CTE's calcium uh, compared to the uh, new risk, uh, risk uh, model of the AHA, the new risk calculator, rather than the framing? Yeah. So the question was in regard to the new AHA ACC risk calculator, has there been an analysis of the added value of chlorine calcium or other tests? So it's interesting. The reason that the risk calculator from AHA and ACC did not really have any added tests in the model was that if you read the, the, the risk calculator description carefully, the cohorts that they used to develop the equation didn't, did not all have all of the tests. So they couldn't test to see whether coronary calcium or C-reactive protein or carotid IMT were actually additive. Um, we've done that analysis. It's not published yet. Uh, I can show it to you at the break because I have it in my computer. The, again, the one test that actually does improve risk discrimination is chlorinated calcium. But in the new risk predictor, the new risk predictor actually is better at discrimination of risk in the intermediate risk population than the previous one, even though it's received all sorts of criticism. But coronary calcium still is additive in that group. 